Today, we get to hear from an FBI agent who is a specialist in cell phone extractions, and she's going to explain a lot about how the FBI uses this technology. Here's what we're talking about today. I'm going to let her tell you all about her background and what she does. My name is Kelly D. Pietrantonio, D-I-P-I-E-T-R-A-N-T-O-N-I-O. Okay. And Ms. D. Uh, what do you do for a living? I'm a special agent with the FBI. Okay. And can you give us a thumbnail sketch of your education, your training, and your experience, please? Sure. Um, I have a Bachelor's of Arts and a Master's of Science from Long Island University. Um, after becoming an agent, or before becoming an agent, I went to Quantico, Virginia and did my 20-week training to become an agent there. Um, I'm also part of the FBI's Cellular Analysis Survey Team, or CAST as we call it, C-A-S-T. Um, and to become a CAST certified agent, you have to, just like anything else that you don't know what you're doing, you start with a basic class, very simple. Um, it's about a two-day class and we learn about the different providers. When I say providers, I'm talking about AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, U.S. Cellular. Um, and they show us the records that they maintain, why they maintain them, how they maintain them, what they look like. And then we figure out all of those records and we figure out a way to actually plot those on a map so you can visually see where these phones possibly were when they were making a phone call or sending a text message or initiating a data session. Um, after the basic class, you're paired up with a mentor and you go back to the field, you work your cases, you practice some of these records on your own, then you can get invited to the advanced class. And that's just like the basic, but just a little more nuanced. You learn um, Google, Facebook, Snapchat, car records, um, very similar to how you can track a phone, you can track a vehicle. Um, so we work with all of those. And then if you do well, again, in advanced, you continue working with that mentor, you go back to the field, you work on those cases and practice working with those records. Um, after that, you can get invited to what's called CIRA. That's the Critical Incident Readiness Assessment, or CIRA. In CIRA, you walk in, it's not an instructor-based class. Um, so you walk in and your teachers will say, okay, today there's a missing three-year-old in Miami-Dade County. Um, this is the phone number for the the father's uh, the child's father. He was last seen with them. Find the child. And again, it's a training environment, so you have to ask for the appropriate records in order to find that child, and then present your findings to um, to your colleagues, to a team that's ready to go out and knock on doors and look for this child. Uh, if you do well in that, again, you go back, practice with those records, come back, and you can take the uh, certification course. The certification course is two two-week sessions broken up into what we call CERT 1 and CERT 2. In CERT 1, you will actually get a chance to sit down with the providers and meet with the custodians of record and the engineers. The custodians of records are the folks that actually pull the records for you when we give them subpoenas and search warrants and exigent requests. Um, and the engineers are obviously the, the folks who create, modify, and optimize the network so that we stay customers because these are billion dollar industries, right? And they want to keep doing that, keep making money, and keep us as customers. Um, so that's a really great opportunity. The second part of CERT, CERT 2, um, or I apologize, in CERT 1, we also get about a semester's worth of training on uh, radio frequency theory from professors from the Florida Institute of Technology. So it's the same professors that are teaching folks who actually go out and do this for a living engineers in the field. Um, in CERT 2, we have the opportunity to learn a new software that we use. It's called ESPA. Um, and then we also learn a new piece of equipment. It's called the Gladiator Autonomous Receiver, or a GAR. If you remember those old commercials, um, I think they were Verizon, where the guy used to walk around and he used to go, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, basically, what the receiver does is exactly that. It will drive every single block in a neighborhood and will act as though we're making a phone call and it will be a Verizon phone, a T-Mobile phone, a Sprint phone, an AT&T phone. And it'll say, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And it'll actually figure out what the footprint of that tower is. So if I were to communicate with a tower, um, or if I was making a call, what tower would I connect to? In order to connect to a tower, one, 
very important, the phone has to decide which tower I'm going to connect to. And it does that based on what it views as the clear, strongest signal for itself at that time. After that, if you're anything like me, um, and you start your day as soon as you get in your car, you start making calls. Um, I live in Broward County, so I'll start making my call at my house, and then I'll drive down to work, and sometimes I go down to Miami. So the ending... A little blue injection is a, a preface to the overall testament. You can continue. You're driving in the scenario. Thank you. Um, so I'll start at my house and then I'll continue driving until I get to work. Um, if I'm headed to Miami that day, my ending tower will be in Miami. So both providers, um, in this case at least, provide both the beginning and ending towers for your records. Don't you just love this girl? I mean, she comes across so mild-mannered and sweet and nice, and she's laying all this information out. She is a very good witness. She understands how to testify, and she understands how to use her personal assets to make a really good impression on this jury. Now, you're probably wondering what that objection was there toward the end of that segment, and essentially it was an objection to narrative testimony. You can't have a witness just narrate their entire testimony. They have to respond to questions. Although the judge certainly could have sustained that objection, he overruled it, and now after this segment, he will ask another question and they'll go on. Okay. And how many of these um, analyses that you previously described have you actually conducted and performed during your career as a, as a special agent for the FBI? Um, well, not every case that I do goes to trial. So I'm looking at phone records on a weekly basis. Um, so I've looked at over 100 phone records, well over 100. Um, but trial is not typically that many. Okay. Um, and how many times have you testified in a court of law regarding these phone analyses that you previously described? Regarding phone analysis, probably about 11 or, t or 12 times. Okay. And you're doing these analyses on a weekly basis? Yes, most okay. of the time, yes. Over the course of how many years? Um, I became certified in 2021, but I started my first basic class. Um, I was a, a tactical analyst beforehand, but you are not allowed to be certified in that position. Um, but I took that class in 2016, so I've been working with these records since 2016. Okay. And were you previously provided with phone records uh, with respect to this case, the state of Florida versus Jose Soto Escalara? I was, yes. Okay, and were you specifically provided with um, Sprint records uh, where the subscriber, in which the subscriber was the defendant, Jose Soto Escalar? Yes, I was. So the jury knows she's competent. She knows, they know she knows what she's doing. Now he asks her about what record she looked at, and then we're going to get her to stand up and explain all of her analysis. And she's very good at this part. Watch. Let's walk through and just make sure that we're specific here. Um, there are two phone numbers, correct? Correct. Uh, the first is 772-607-0257. Okay. Which individual is that phone number associated with? That's associated with Tanya Wise. Okay. And then the second phone number, 772-200-61. Which individual is that associated with? Mr. Escalara. Okay. We can advance to slide two. So, and I think you described a lot of this already, but why don't you go ahead and just put a, a briefly summarize um, what we're looking at here. Sure. So this just says what I did in my involvement in this case. I was given some records. I was given um, points of interest for this case and times of interest, as well as dates of interest. Um, I mapped the records around those dates, times, and locations of interest um, using my software, and then I drew my own conclusions from those records. Okay, and go ahead and advance to slide three. So what are we looking at here? This slide just shows examples of cell phone towers. Um, something I think that it's important to note here is um, just because you see a cell phone tower doesn't necessarily mean that your phone is communicating with that tower if you're close to it. Um, so for example, I have Verizon for my personal phone. Um, so my phone can only see Verizon towers. I may be standing underneath an, an AT&T tower. My phone doesn't even recognize that tower. So just because you're close to one doesn't necessarily mean that your phone is talking to that tower. Um, 
And then something else just to note here is that carriers nowadays, depending upon the location, will try to have the cell phone towers blend in. They're not always these ugly structures on the side of the road like maybe we're used to seeing. Um, so I think that cactus on the on the left hand side there, I think that is in Arizona. I think Wyoming has one that's kind of built into like a billboard of a bison. Um, so again, just because you see them doesn't necessarily mean your phone's talking to them. And just because you don't see them or potentially you don't see them doesn't necessarily mean they're not there. Okay. And we'll go ahead and advance the fourth slide. Okay. Why don't you just describe for the jury what we're looking at? Sure. So most towers have three sides. Some towers have six sides, some have one. Those are called omnidirectional towers. But for the purpose of this report, I think most of the towers in this report have three sides. Um, when each tower is placed on Earth, it's not always pointed in the same direction. So we call that the, the azimuth or the orientation. And that's another column that we'll see in those call detail records. The carriers will let us know how the tower is oriented so we know which direction this signal emanated from the tower to the phone. Um, if you look at the photo all the way to the right, that's how I'll display cell sites that were um, that the phone interacted with. Um, that shaded area does not show where the phone was located. That simply is just a guide for the direction the signal traveled. So it can or cannot be within that shaded area. Um, and then a good way, I think, to think of my report, this is kind of a, a weird comparison, I know, but um, See how those lines are straight and it's very neat and kind of sharp looking? Um, I, I like to compare that to almost like a cherry pie at Cheesecake Factory. It always comes really neat. The sides are straight. But if you ever cut a cherry pie at home, it's not neat. There's cherries that fall out. Um, and even if you were to smack that cherry pie at home, typically it's still going to be that wedge shape. And you can tell it's a, it's a pie, right? But you may have a couple crumbs that are not attached at all at that point. Um, and that's actually a more realistic depiction of what the footprint of a cell tower actually looks like. Radio frequency is not a straight line, it's jagged. Um, so just keep that in mind when we're looking at the report. The report has these sharp lines just to show a direction or, or again as a guide, um, but radio frequency does not travel in a straight line like that. I think what the expert there is saying is that the, the azimuths and the, uh, the branching out or the wedge shape of the of the tower may not necessarily be exactly 120 degrees, but radio frequencies absolutely travel in a straight line. They don't travel in a jagged line. They travel at the speed of light and they travel straight line. That's why, particularly for UHF, which is what these are actually ultra UHF uh, cell phones are, they're up like around 968 megahertz. So those are straight line and they're line of sight so that if you're beyond the horizon, unless you're bouncing off of another cell tower that's going to communicate it that way, you don't have uh, any kind of connection with your cell phone at that point. But other than that, it's a pretty decent explanation of, of what she's doing. You can tell she really knows how to testify. Now let's listen to some of her conclusions about the evidence that she looked at. So here you see how we have a 38 second call. Here's a 38 second call and it's just 38 seconds after the first one. This is actually the ending tower for this same call. So that's why we don't have a phone number over here as well. Um, so the call started over here from this tower and ended on this tower. Now in between those two, we have a timing and advance bark. And uh, cell phone coverage kind of works similar to a sprinkler system in your yard. You want to have a little bit of overlap just so you don't drop calls because, again, these people are in business to make money. If you're dropping calls, you're going to leave and you're going to go to another provider, right? They don't want that. So what they'll do is they'll create a little bit of overlap, but not too much that it overflows your lawn and your lawn is overflowed with water. Um, in, in the radio frequency world, that creates what's called a lot of noise in the network. Um, and it gets difficult for the phones to hear the towers, the towers to hear the phones, and vice versa. Um, based on how short this call was and where this time in advance point is, you can see that it's almost right in the middle of both of those towers, which tells me, knowing that there's no more towers in between here, that the phone was likely in this area when it made that phone call. Um, after it made that phone call at 9.52, we'll go to this one at 10 p.m. here. Uh, Mr. Escalara's phone made a call to a number ending in 8475, south of that initial call from the slide. 
but again, using a, a sector that was pointed northbound. And that's this one right here. And we can see that the timing advance arc for that tower was about 1.3 miles away from the tower. I think that was the slide. Okay. And um, let me ask you this. What is the closest point that the defendant, that the defendant's phone, Jose Seco Escalara, got within the uh, intersection of Johnston Road and Russo Road, which is our crime scene? So this right here, this red flag is, again, the crime scene where the victim's body was found. This to the tower is 4.33 miles. I would say that that is probably less than two miles away. Okay. And is that, does that include the outside of the, of the, uh, of the crime scene as well? Yes, it does. Okay. Okay. And if we could go, I believe that's the last slide. You go to, okay, that is the last slide. Oh, thank you. Um, you can. Thank you. Okay, um, Agent DP Trantonio, thank you very much. I have no further questions. Defense counsel may have some for me. Thank you. No cross steps. Thank you. May this witness be released from the meeting at this time? Any objection to releasing? No objection. Thank you, Agent B. D. P. Tranconio. If you are releasing your subpoena, you're free to stay or leave as you wish. Thank you. Thank you. The defense is not asking a lot of questions of these technical experts. In large part, I think, because they don't she doesn't feel like that hurt her client. Those cell phone calls, it was only the calls that actually showed up on this. There was not a, a cell phone download, I guess, that, that they could track using this technology. And so she obviously didn't think it hurt her client, so she's not even going to bother to do a cross-examination of her. But that was a really well-presented explanation of how they use this kind of material and this kind of information, although it's kind of sad that they can only do this kind of analysis when there's a phone call active on the towers at the time. Now, whether this advances the, the prosecution's case or not, it's hard to tell, but obviously they think it does or they wouldn't have put her up. 